when the issues at stake concern compromising the gospel message itself, avoiding confrontation is sinfully man-centered and self-serving. Welcome to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a broadcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss Reformed theology and cultural issues from a Reformed perspective. You're listening to episode 126, and I'm Jared Luchibor, Director of Marketing. Thank you for tuning in. In today's episode, Dr. Marcus Minninger continues our series on resolving conflict with peers, all from the perspective of the Apostle Paul. Today, he's going to focus on Galatians 2, 11 through 14, where the Apostle Paul confronts Peter, whose hypocritical conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. In other words, what Dr. Minninger will show us today is the importance of confronting one another out of reverence for God. We can look later in Galatians 2, particularly in verses 11 through 14, to see a different response that Paul has to conflict, even uh, some of it with the same people. Galatians 2, 11 through 14 show us the response of confronting one another out of reverence for God. One of the things that's often neglected about the book of Galatians generally is how the root of the problem that Paul confronts among the Judaizers involves a clear desire to please people. This is one of the topics that's being debated in a sense back and forth between those in Galatia and Paul, the desire to please people and so to treat the church as an essentially human institution in which we might gain praise from others. In fact, Paul says quite plainly toward the end of the letter that this desire to please others is exactly what motivates the Judaizing preachers. He says this in chapter 6, verses 12 through 13. He says, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. And then he goes on, they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. And here it is then in 6, 12 through 13, we see kind of both sides of man-centeredness. We see fear of man on the one hand, not wanting to be persecuted. And then we see uh, a desire to gain recognition from man on the other and to boast in the flesh. And yet, ironically, it's precisely because the Judaizers have this man-centeredness and this desire to uh, look good in front of others that uh, they also accuse Paul of the very same thing. So early in Galatians, in chapter 1, verse 10, uh, we see this lurking in the background. Paul says, uh, as he's describing uh, his gospel and the fact that he's... he's um, Concerned about the Galatians abandoning it so quickly, he's confronting them right out of the gate. And then after he confronts them, he says, Galatians 1.10, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were, I would not be a servant of Christ. In the larger context, uh, the Judaizers and others seem to be accusing Paul of being inconsistent in his ministry, that he flip-flops and that he changes back and forth, uh, saying different things to different people in different contexts in order to please them and not ruffle their feathers. And this is a, part of, a big part of the reason why Paul uh, launches into the long account of his own ministry that he does in Galatians 1 and 2, which we've read part of, because he's trying to show that he was not unduly influenced by people's opinions. And he did, in fact, speak and act consistently in the company of different people in terms of the uh, content of his message. But while Paul insists that his message and his guiding interests were consistent... In other words, that his commitment to God in Christ was unswerving, the same at each juncture, we do need to notice how the way that comes to expression, the way that his God-centeredness comes to expression in verses 11 through 14 is quite different in one sense than it was in Galatians 2.2. We saw in Galatians 2.2, Paul's God-centered commitment to the gospel led him to submit himself to others. Now in Galatians 2, 11 through 14, we see that this same commitment to pleasing God rather than people leads him to confront others who are undermining the gospel of God's 
free grace through their public actions. Here we can see even more clearly than in Galatians 2.2 that just as Paul himself was not the center of his own ministry, neither were his peers. Paul did not submit himself to Peter and others in chapter 2 verse 2 because he was entangled in the fear of man or because he was drunk with a desire to please people and to gain their approval. You see, it's one thing to be self-protective or arrogant and so refuse to be criticized, but it's another thing to be led or to be consumed by the opinions of others, yet both are in essence man-centered. And this desire to please others or a preoccupation with the opinion of others could come from fear of their opinion or it come for, could come from a desire to gain something by their approval. But in either case, the main thing to avoid if you're preoccupied with the opinion of others is, of course, confrontation. It's much more expedient instead to downplay issues even if they really need to be dealt with, to delay, to hide. But Paul's confrontation of Peter and of others in Galatians 2, 11 through 14 goes precisely in the other direction. Again, because of Paul's God-centered orientation towards God himself and God's own glory rather than to practical expediency in human terms. Clearly, the stakes in this confrontation at the end of Galatians 2 are quite high for Paul. He says repeatedly in this chapter that those in Jerusalem are highly influential and well-regarded in the church. They were established. Everybody already thought highly of them and looked to them, and so Paul's risking quite a lot to confront them. Peter's approval of Paul's ministry, the financial support of churches that look to Peter as a leader, the possibility of greater persecution as his opponents gain more fuel for their resistance to him. If Paul could simply be more politically savvy, we might think, or seek to get along better, is Paul not walking away here from a great opportunity to promote his mission if he could just curry favor a bit more? When the issues at stake concern compromising the gospel message itself, Avoiding confrontation is sinfully man-centered and self-serving. Again, we can often concoct many, concoct many explanations for how our man-centered fear or our man-centered opportunism is really somehow something that's serving the gospel, but Paul doesn't. Instead, he again remains consisting, consistent, acting out of theological principle, acting out of theological conviction, not acting out of what is comfortable to himself or pragmatic. On the one hand then, if there is a question of Paul's own fidelity, that he might be running in vain, he submits himself self to others for their scrutiny. But on the other hand, if others are compromising the gospel and calling the full legitimacy of Gentile Christians into question by their actions, and therefore, of course, calling the completely grace-based nature of the gospel into question as well, Paul rises to the occasion, even at risk to himself. And he went to Peter directly to seek his repentance. Now, in our day, it's worth noting at least two things about how Paul confronted Peter. First, Paul went to him personally Second, he went to him to recover Peter for the sake of restitution or, as I said, repentance. In other words, Paul did not first get on email or social media and blast Peter or badmouth him to other people. Those tend mainly to be ways either to protect ourselves or to get glory for ourselves. If Paul had wished to be pragmatic... He once again might really have been able to advance his own cause at this time when Peter was being inconsistent. What a great opportunity to show that his cause, Paul's cause, is correct and Peter's is the one who needs to be taken down a few notches. Come to Paul's church. Go to Paul's conferences. But Paul's way of dealing with this issue shows what his true goal is and shows yet again how he's not out for his own gain. 
If he wanted a following and if he wanted recognition, he could have used Peter's inconsistency to his own advantage. If he was fearing Peter, he could go and get others in his corner first and bring a whole group of people to confront Peter, allies on his side. Instead, Paul takes the lonely walk to Peter's door, as it were, to speak to him face to face, come what may. We can reflect here again how Paul's actions go against so many different forms of human wisdom. Often we're tempted to stand back in fear. Well, what will Peter think of me? What will others think of me? I'm confronting Peter for crying out loud. It'll be a huge mess. Difficult to resolve. Better let just things, just let things lie. How big of a deal is it really anyway? Peter's only not eating with Gentiles sometimes. And after all, Peter's just trying to keep peace with some of the men who came from James. Does Peter really have to eat with Gentiles all the time? Out of fear, we can often rationalize ourselves to think that a problem isn't, isn't consequential when it really is. Or on the flip side, human wisdom might say that, well, you know, you get more with honey than you do with vinegar, right? You need Peter's support, don't you? Look at the big picture, Paul. Don't make too big a deal out of this. Having Peter's support could really help the Gentiles in the long run. It's better to let this issue of inconsistency go. For the sake of gospel effectiveness, we might even convince ourselves, I won't confront someone with as much stature as Peter because it will do more harm than good. But is that truly serving God's kingdom purposes? Or is it, again, just pragmatism? The purity and the unity of the church are truly at stake in Galatians 2 in what Peter is doing. And in such situations, it's not gospel-centered, but in fact, sinfully man-centered to avoid conflict. In the end, Paul must understand, as this letter makes clear, that he does not actually need Peter's support for his gospel if it were truly to come to that. The gospel, again, is the work of God, not of Peter, and not even of Paul. Our job is to be faithful to the Lord and to his word and to let him take care of the outcomes. Maybe we will be less effective, humanly speaking, due to faithfully engaging a conflict that must be engaged. We may perhaps become marginalized, even as the Isra Israel's prophets of old often were. But that, in the end, is for the Lord to choose. Ours is to follow his will. And so I ask you, how do you do with this? Is having to confront others a bigger struggle for you than having to submit yourself to others, or vice versa? In our next episode, Dr. Minninger concludes this series on resolving conflict with peers by examining Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. There we find another example of a God-centered response to conflict in the life of the Apostle Paul, one modeled after the example of Christ himself, that being quiet rejoicing. We hope you'll tune in then. For more episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts. And wherever you listen to your favorite shows, be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reform Seminaries Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time. <laughs>